and somebody came back, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> I don't think Father Clark would like it very much if it was just us talking to each other. <laughs> but we would be in the presence of our Lord. So. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Take a little bit of a deep breath. This talk I don't think will be quite as long, so I don't have to talk quite as fast. So we can take a deep breath and relax just a little bit. Um, because the message here is very, very simple. Uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. It's just hard to do. Um, when we think about living a Christian life, As I said earlier this morning, we have a tendency to compare ourselves negatively to the lives of the saints. You know, I can never measure up, I can never do that, I can never be like them, and so on. When we think about living a Christian life, we seldom think about ourselves in comparison to the saints. Uh, for, that, for that reason, I think we, we, we're, we're pretty down on ourselves, we don't feel like we, we're gonna, we'll ever measure up. Um, we're going to talk more about that in the, in the, in the third talk, I think. Uh, at least I, I think all of these are going to go together. <laughs> we'll see. Um, we have a tough time comparing ourselves to the saints, let alone comparing ourselves to Jesus himself. But remember how we started this. The gospel message is the reality that you and I were called to be in union with Jesus. We're united to Jesus and we enter into the Trinitarian life. That's why we're made. Why we're created, that's what we're there for. So we should be like Jesus. You know, that's the church's job, to make more Jesuses, in a sense. Being recorded, not, you know, not literally. <laughs> <laughs> it's really rather remarkable, though, that we approach the life of faith this way. I think it's a huge mistake. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard someone say some form of, look, I, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed anyone lately. Right? I could have paid for your renovation upstairs. As many times as I've heard some form of that. I add the lately part because I just think that's kind of funny. But uh, I didn't kill anyone lately. But it's as if a serial killer is the benchmark for what makes a Christian and what doesn't. Nowhere in the Gospels, nowhere in the Scriptures will you find that the benchmark for entrance into heaven is whether or not you've committed murder. I mean that literally, right? Uh, now, an unrepented murderer is probably not going to get in. But the key there is not so much the sin as the repentance. Right? Most assuredly, murder is not the telltale sign of whether or not we are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Again, the telltale sign is repentant or not repentant. And the attitude of comparing ourselves to the most evil people we can think of 
is a huge mistake. I understand why we do it. It makes us feel better. You know? We can take that deep breath. It's easier. That's a, you know, you set the bar way down here. That's a much easier bar to, I'm way down here, for those of you on this side, I'm way down here. That's a much easier bar to reach. But it, that is absolutely ruining, and ruining our opportunity to live a life transformed by Christ. Because if, if he's not going to force himself on us if we don't need him, if we feel like we don't need him, he's not going to force himself on us. And he's the transformative power in our lives. Look at Peter on the water. It's not his own doing. So when we compare ourselves to the most evil people we can think of, it's absolutely ruining our opportunity. And I'm using, obviously, I'm using a a, 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 a wild example, right? But you know you know, we do this. We look at our friends, family members, maybe people who aren't practicing the faith. Well, at least I'm going to church on Sunday. I, I sit in the back corner. I don't pay attention. I check my watch. I maybe even place a bet or two on the upcoming football game during Mass. But at least I'm there, unlike fill in the blank. That's what we do. And when we do this, it, it's absolutely ruining our opportunity to live a life transformed by Christ. And it's absolutely re, re, ruining our, an opportunity that we have to be a gift to the other people in our life as well. And our benchmark, brothers and sisters, is Jesus. So I began this, this passage, or this, uh, this little talk here with the Beatitudes. Too often ignored. Too often ignored in my own life. Just speak for myself. As if, uh, that's, I hardly can't possibly, you know, do that. I can barely keep some of the commandments, let alone uh, the Beatitudes, right? But when we're talking about a life transformed by the power of grace, that's, that really is possible to be an imitator of Jesus, to be a little Jesus if you will. Previously, we talked about the fact that each one of us is called to be a saint. Each one of us is invited into a profound relationship with God and to be transformed and enlivened by His grace. And we said this relationship that is so transforming and so powerful in our life is a relationship. That means it's a two-way street. God is always pursuing us, no matter how far, no, even when we're turning away from Him, even when we're running away from Him. Have you ever done that? Been there. Even when that happens, God in his love is always pursuing us. He never gives up on us ever. And he's always making an invitation. He won't force it. But he's always making that invitation to us to turn back to him and then to share intimately in his life. More and more deeply. More and more deeply. But because this is a two-way street, in addition to pursuing us, as I mentioned earlier this morning, he also invites us to come to him, to close the gap between us and him. In the last talk, I described that as getting out of the boat and moving toward Jesus on the water. And I think sometimes it is that difficult. As important as it is to believe that we really are, with all our weaknesses and sins, called to be in union with him, the key to entering into that union is often overcoming some obstacles. I mentioned a couple in the first talk. Overcoming those obstacles is rooted in what we call conversion. Again, we have, I think sometimes we have this idea, this is why this is a simple talk, it's a simple message, is we have this idea that conversion is, is that's what, for murderers who then need to repent, you know? But... Conversion in the way that we talk about it in the church, in the way the saints talk about it, in the way the fathers of the church talk about it, conversion in our life is turning back to God, simply. Whether we've committed serious, mortal sins, terrible evils, or little sins and little evils. It's just turning back to God, closing the gap between us and God to the best of our ability with the help of His grace, and overcoming the obstacles, the obstacles that get in the way of our union with God. I mentioned the quote in your retreat packet 
uh, so you can go back and look at it. But this blew me this blew me away when I read this one time. Saint Saint Bernard of Clairvaux was a great saint, um, spiritual master. He was abbot for many many years, leading a group of religious in a monastery. One day, this young abbot was speaking to his community, and he made a remark that might seem a little shocking. He said. There are more people converted from mortal sin to grace than there are religious converted from good to better. No, that doesn't do anything for you. Wow, let me try it again. (laughs) He said, this isn't me. This is Bernard of Clairvaux, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. There are more people converted from mortal sin to grace than there are religious converted from good to better. That's, thank you. There we go. <laughs> See, that sense of urgency just isn't there. When our soul's on the line, when it's the difference between heaven and hell, the urgency is there. Praise God for that. Otherwise, so many more souls would be going to hell. Because hell's real. But there's, no, there's so much less urgency oftentimes in our own life to move from, from, from good to better, from better to best. That's the way we'll talk about it. Certainly, Bernard was speaking specifically to those sitting right in front of him, right? A group of religious. But what Bernard said of religious is so true in all states of life. Bishops, priests, married men, married women, single people. Putting his observation in simple contemporary terms, Bernard was saying that there are more, there are more men and women who give up serious alienation from God, mortal sin, than there are people who give up small wrongs, willed venial sins. And there are even fewer who grow into heroic virtue and live as the saints live. How often we're just, it just doesn't bother us. We enter into a little gossip. Uh, For me, I mean, this uh, this focus jacket doesn't hide it very well. I have a, you know, I eat a lot of stuff. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me to have a third, okay, yeah, I'm, Working on honesty in front of the Blessed Sacrament, a fifth cinnamon roll. It doesn't bother me. And it needs to bother me. Right? That, that's, that's, that's not virtue. Right? But it, it has a tendency not to bother us. We don't think about it. There's not that sense of urgency. That's the best way I can think of it. And what we need to be reminded of is the reality of the Beatitudes. Huh? Jesus in the Beatitudes. That's at the heart of what we're striving for. And that's what grace is trying to do in our lives. And conversion is us cooperating, trying to close that gap on our end. Grace is trying to make us little Jesuses. Grace is trying to make us into saints. And we we kind of fight it. We kind of of ignore it. As long as we're safe, meaning, you know, probably not going to hell. I haven't killed anyone lately. then then, Then we're okay with that. And there's all this grace, all this opportunity that's just waiting there, waiting there, waiting there, and it's ignored. So this is what it feels like to me in my own life. The idea of conversion of life for most people is heavily negative, right? When I talk about the fifth cinnamon roll, uh, it's even threatening sometimes, the idea of conversion. It suggests giving up fun things. That I'm telling you, you know, most bakers, that fifth cinnamon roll tastes just as good as that first one. And you're asking me to give that up? Fun things, making sacrifices, cutting down, cutting out of our life, getting rid of numerous selfishnesses. Look, I get that. I get that. That's why conversion oftentimes takes a little while. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is also precisely why we compare ourselves to a serial killer and decide that, decide that we're just fine the way we are. It's, I'm okay. I'm fine. I gave a homily a few weeks ago based on that line. It's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Right? Which, by the way, usually when we say that and the more we say it, the more not fine we are. But that's for another homily. But it's understandable to think only in terms of what we might have to change or give up when it comes to conversion of life. But this is only a small aspect of a larger and more liberating truth. This is what we talked about in the first in the first talk, right? When we talk about conversion, we're actually talking about transformation. I mean, 
When we look at the life of Peter, do we, do we see what they gave up? Do we, do we pay attention to all the things that, that, that he gave up? We, we don't. Not, not looking back at it. We can imagine that might be a, a part of his interaction with Christ at the very beginning. We can see that to a certain, certain extent in his weaknesses and his failures and his sins. But, man, when we look at the lives of the saints, I, I, I would argue that's probably why we get those sensational views Viewpoints sometimes of the lives of the saints, right? Because because the, the author wants to remind us, no, 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 I, I know you think they gave up a lot, but they didn't. There's so much good going on here. There is so much to be said for this union with Jesus. You can't even imagine what it's like to live in this union with Jesus. Amazing things happen. That's what they're trying to get across. When we're talking about conversion, we're actually talking about transformation. It's an openness to us. Again, it's a movement into that gap just a little bit. So much of it is God's grace. Put simply, conversion is a basic and noticeable improvement of the human person on the level of the will. I didn't come up with that. I just read it. I didn't come up with any of this. (laughs) I read it. Conversion is a basic and noticeable improvement on the human person on the level of our will. Even more particularly... Conversion is a fundamental change in our willed activities. And we typically talk about it in those three levels. The choices that we make from bad to good, that's the one we always think about in terms of conversion. But also from good to better and from better to best. And to me, that's transformation. Yeah, it's conversion. That's our part of it is conversion. But really, we're opening ourselves up to the transformative power of grace. It's true, grace is there, present there as well from bad to good, but especially, I think we see it, from good to better, from better to best. That's grace. It's the transformative power of grace made possible by our willingness to convert. Conversion is a change from vice to virtue, from deceit and lying to honesty and truth, gluttony to temperance, vanity to humility, lust to love, avarice to generosity, rage to to patience, laziness, to zeal, ugliness, to beauty, and so on and so forth. We come up with many more. A willingness to move in that direction. To encounter grace, to be transformed by the power of grace. Speaking about this from the perspective of our relationship with God, I want to make sure that we make this connection, right? We're not just talking about virtue here in the sense of human virtues, natural virtues, um, temporal virtues, but... In the, from the perspective of our relationship with God, conversion and transformation includes a change from little or no prayer to a determined practice of Christ-centered meditation, leading eventually to contemplative intimacy. And then listen to this. I didn't make up these terms. This comes from the spiritual fathers, right? Pondering the word day and night, leading to a sublime gazing on the beauty of the Lord. See, now we're seeing less Conversion in the sense that we always think of it and more transformation by the power of grace. Gazing on the beauty of the Lord. Does that sound boring to you? It's not boring at all. Similar to the idea of seeing the life of discipleship as something more than just and then not just than just not killing another person. We need to be able to see the concept of conversion in our life as something more than just changing from atheism to theism or from converting from one one religion to another. It's more than that. And and it's never over. Conversion is about any, any moral or spiritual developments for the better. Certainly giving up mortal and venial sin, mortal sins, you know, certainly at the beginning, but venial sins as well. Loving and serving God and our neighbors more and more perfectly growing in a deepening prayer intimacy with the indwelling Trinity. Deepening that, growing in that, moving forward in that. As we continue to turn away from those things which lead us away from God and toward the things that draw us into the life of God, namely grace. While there are accounts of conversions that take place instantaneously, which I've always thought was amazing, for a long time I just waited for that to happen. (laughs) Who needs effort on my part? Right? Hey, Jesus, if you really want this, me and Augustine, let's, you know, do the same thing. You did it there. Do it here. So there are examples of conversions that take place instantaneously, some that happen rapidly, even if not in an instant. 
but more commonly the path of conversion is gradual. As I like to put it, and sorry for those of you who have heard me talk before, but I use this all the time, um, it's not surprising that most saints are old. Right? Because it just it, it's, it takes time. It's gradual. For most of us, it's a gradual process of turning away from those things that lead us away from God and turning toward the power of God's grace and that transformative um, gift of His. In fact, when saints are young, we typically make note of it. Don't we? Precisely because it's so unusual. I remember in the, when I was at the Newman Center and the students would always talk about the 24-year-old club. There are a handful, a number of saints, a whole bunch of them who died when they were 24. Canonized saints. We made a club for them because it's so unusual. Right? There's a reason why saints are old. But listen, the process can happen in any number of ways. So, because I... I you know, I'm old already, and I'm not anywhere near a saint. One or two of you are older than me. <laughs> so we have a tendency to think, well, this isn't for me, right? Like that ship has sailed. But, that's, but again, that's putting too much of the emphasis on us. The transformative power of God's grace, we'll talk more about this in our third talk. The transformative power of grace can work in any number of ways. God has his plan, he has his will, he has his power. He has his gifts. It can happen. Are we, willing, are we willing to turn away from the things that lead us away from him and turn toward him in the power of his grace? And the fact that the types of conversion that we're talking about here are so gradual is one of the main reasons why we're often not that interested in pursuing that kind of transformative relationship with God that we described in the first talk. In our world of instant gratification, if I can't have what I, ha what I want right now, perhaps it's not worth having. Big mistake. Unfortunately, there are often other reasons as well. As I cited at the beginning of the talk, the most essential reason for why we will not engage in conversion from good to better or better to best is our acceptance of mediocrity. We're just, we're just willing to be <coughs> mediocre. You're well aware of the passage. I debated whether or not to put this in there. It's so cliche, but it's scripture, brothers and sisters. So you're aware of the passage from the book of Revelation written to the community of Laodicea. I know all about you, how you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are neither, but only lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say to yourself, I am rich, I have made a fortune, I have, and have everything I wanted, never realizing that you are wretchedly and pitiably poor, and blind and naked too. And it continues on. First and foremost, brothers and sisters, we must become very convinced that deep conversion in your life, in our, in our lives, in your life will ultimately make you far happier and fulfilled in your marriage, in your family life, and even in your work, in every aspect of your life. This is the transformative power of grace. It's not just a spiritual thing. It's not just something that it, it comes into our life in the sacraments and in prayer, but it, it comes out every, uh, every aspect of our life. It's visible and powerful in every aspect of our life. And all those around you will be far happier and fulfilled as well because it comes out of us in every aspect of our life. A second motive is very powerful. And I just decided to quote this, so bear with me here. This is a little bit of a long quote, but Father Thomas Dubay, one of my favorite authors on the spiritual life, he puts it rather bluntly as a motivation for why this deep conversion, this trans opening ourselves up to the transformative power of grace is so very, very important. He says, you husbands and fathers say that you love your wives and children. Okay, I'm going to take you seriously. Now, if you love them really, that is for their genuine welfare and not simply for what you can get from them, or whether they do or do not return your love as you would like it to be returned. I repeat, if you love them really, then prove it in the best way possible. Become a saint. Get rid of your faults. Love totally. Why is this the best thing you can do for them? Your impact for their genuine eternal welfare will be tremendous. Yes, you also show love for your wife and children by putting bread on the table and a roof over their heads. But the best proof of genuine love is found in the example of an exemplary life, a tremendous spur to their eternal enthrallment. 
and yours as well. Obviously, the same can be said for wives and mothers, for priests, and for consecrated brothers and sisters. A life truly converted can profoundly impact the lives of those around them. The lives of the saints are wonderful examples of this. We could go on and on. St. Francis of Assisi, right, covered Europe with his friars. Uh, they were just drawn to him. St. Teresa of Avila was greeted by crowds when people heard that she and her nuns were on their way to their city to establish a new monastery. St. John Vianney was like, a, was like a huge magnet drawing thousands to the privilege of confessing their sins to him. Sounds crazy. The saints did not need advertising or programs or gimmicks. They help those of us who are still not quite there yet. But they didn't need those things to reach the multitudes. One of my, I think we got a little time here. I just want to, I, again, if you've heard me talk, uh, you've probably heard this example, but it just was so powerful for my life. And I just want to share it. Um, one of my favorite images of Pope John Paul II um, came from a video from a long time ago called, um, oh my goodness, now what was it called? Fishers of Men. It was a little video put out by the USCCB, and it was to attract vocations, and it was about the priesthood. It was called Fishers of Men. It was beautifully done. And it, it's a 20-minute video, something like that, and in the course of it, they talked about John Paul II and what a great example he was for priests and so on. And in the midst of it, they, they talk about John Paul II, and then they go into this montage of images with John Paul II at his, you know, at uh, World Youth Days and so on and so forth. And they're quick. They go one image to another, to another, to another, uh, and the music is playing. It's very emotional. It's very powerful. And you see this image. And I'm telling you, it affects me to this day. I saw this for the first time 20 years ago. And, I, and I, it moves me every time I see it. But there's this image, and it's a split second in, this, in the video where John Paul II, he's in his Pope mobile, right? And he's, and he's, and he's in St. Peter's Square. And the, and the image is there as he goes by. He's, he's reaching out, and there's a, a young girl uh, a teenage, probably teenage girl, young adult girl, who is reaching up to him, and she is weeping, tears coming down her cheeks, right, with this smile on her face like you've never seen in your life. So these are not tears of sadness. These are tears of joy. She's reaching up, and John Paul II is reaching out to her, right? And, it, and I'm telling you, it's like that, and then it moves on to the next, to the next image. But that scene is forever embedded in my mind. Because think about that for a moment, the way she was reacting, that smile on her face, the tears coming down her face, her reaching out, him reaching to her. Is that because she thought Carol Waitiwa was really cool? She didn't look Polish to me. It wasn't a national thing, I don't think. Is that because of just a tremendous respect that she had for the office of the Holy Father, the Roman Pontiff? I don't think so. I think she saw Christ. I think she saw Jesus. And it was powerful for her. It would be amazing to talk to her about that moment and how that moment affected her for the rest of her life. That's what this is about. That's what conversion is about. Being transformed into another Jesus. Jesus. For the sake of those around us. Pope John Paul II, paraphrasing St. Catherine of Siena, remarked that if you are what you should be, you set the whole world ablaze. One of my favorite accounts of this phenomenon, uh, this comes from an article written by Dr. Peter Kreeft. Oh, man. He said, Peter Kreeft says, A bishop asked one of the priests of his diocese for recommendations on ways to increase vocations. The priest replied, the best way to attract men in this diocese to the priesthood, Your Excellency, would be your canonization. How true that is. You know, it's a difficult thing. Uh, I, some of you might be aware I um, have the St. Monica Project, uh, just trying to encourage and help parents to pray for their children who are not practicing the Catholic faith and to come back to the faith. And I have lots of conversations with people I shouldn't say lots, some conversations with people um, about this when they know that, that this is a part of what I've done in the past. And, you know, sometimes it's, uh, I, I, I often can't be this blunt about it. 
But the very best thing that you can do to attract your children to the life of Christ, to a life with Christ, to a union with Christ, is to be in union with Christ yourself. Your canonization. Imagine what that would do, what that could do. Most of the time, very powerful. I'm waiting for one of you to probably come up at the end of the talk and talk about one of the saints who's um, left the practice of the faith and never returned. I don't know. <laughs> but most of the time, right? How powerful and impactful that is. That transformative power of grace exudes out of us. Okay, so much for this being a short talk. Huh? Um, one, last, one last thing. When we're settled into moral and spiritual mediocrity, are we really happy? When we put ourselves up against the, the most evil people that we can think of and consider ourselves in pretty good shape, is that really making us happy? Is that, is that really the adventure that we're looking for in this life? Is that how we want to live this life? I don't think so. I think too often that's just moving from one form of medication or numbing agent to another. Until the end. Brothers and sisters, each one of us is called to a real intimacy with God. God invites us to come to him to close the gap between us. And we do this by continuous conversion. Not just that initial conversion from evil to good, from mortal sin to grace, but that continuous conversion to the last breath that we take from good to better, from better to best, allowing the grace of God to transform us. Our motivation for conversion is for us, it's for those that we love, and for so many others around us. We need to look at our lives and find the areas of our life that are still in need of conversion. I have them, you have them, we all have them. Pick the one that we think will be most fruitful. Spend some time. It doesn't have to be all today, but it maybe throughout the, you know, some time at the beginning of this Lenten season. Take a look at our life. Where can we turn back? Where can we turn away from the things that lead us away from God and turn back to the Lord, opening ourselves up to the power of His grace? What aspects of our life can we turn back to Him? Turn away from Him and turn back to Him. And take stock of those things and look at them and say, which, which of these would be most impactful to me and to the people around me? Which one of these, if I, if I changed one thing, or maybe two things, what if one thing, what would, it, what would affect my family life the most? Me and my family life the most. And then take a couple of steps toward changing that aspect of our lives. Entering into that process, that continual process of conversion. Because brothers and sisters, ultimately we're going, we're moving all the way well past even a repentant serial killer. <laughs> Sounds terrible. All the way to Jesus. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.